grateful to Jack Dwyer and his team at the CFG Bank for offering to match all charitable gifts to the banner between now and the end of this year with $250,000 in matching funds. So as you finalize your year-end giving, please remember a gift to us will have double the impact. So thanks to Jack and the CFG Extraordinary Generosity. Now I'm, I'm honored to bring our featured guest to the stage of, of Impact Maryland. Uh, but before I introduce him, have you, have you ever noticed uh, the lengths people will go to to avoid pronouncing this guy's last name? <laughs> that is how today's special guest came to be known as Mayor Pete. In 2012, at the ripe old age of 29, Pete was elected as the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, where he revitalized the city through ambitious uh, initiatives in urban development and job creation. Mayor Pete's signature program, repairing 1,000 neglected homes in 1,000 days, was celebra a celebrated success and an inspiration to other cities, including Baltimore. Concurrent with his time in office, he served as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Naval Reserve and came to be, to be known there as Lieutenant Pete, performing high-level counterintelligence operations under dangerous conditions. In 2020, Lieutenant Pete audaciously began wondering if his next job shouldn't be Commander-in-Chief Pete and entered the race to be the Democratic nominee for president. Eventually, people took notice of Mayor Pete. He briefly became known as Iowa Pete when he won the first in the nation presidential caucus. Now, as President Biden's choice to run the U.S. Department of Transportation, he has acquired his most recent moniker, Secretary Pete. From his key role in developing the bipartisan infrastructure law to creating grants that fund mass transit initiatives in our very own Baltimore, his accomplishments in this job have been just as impressive as the rest of his career. In fact, given his track record, who is to say if this guy might someday be known as POTUS Pete? Asking questions of our friend Pete will be the Banner's political reporter, Pam Wood. And so it is with great pride that I welcome Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks very much. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming to the first Impact Maryland and joining me and Secretary Buttigieg today. Um, Secretary, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. And let's start off with the important news of the day. Of course, the attacks by Hamas on Israel. President Biden has you know, reiterated the United States' strong support for Israel, but what's next for the U.S. here? Well, I, I want to begin just by recognizing the pain caused by these violent terrorist attacks by Hamas on the Israeli people. And the, the, the president has led the administration and, and the country in responding to that by reaffirming our belief in Israel's right to self-defense and our friendship and support for the people of Israel. And we know that there will be more pain for so many, not just impacted directly by this violence, but with uh, any connection to the region. Um, uh, I've been in touch with, uh, with Israel's ambassador to the U.S. and with my counterpart with a specific focus on transportation and, and safety, uh, which will come into play in, in, we think, a number of ways in, in the response. Uh, but uh, I believe we'll be hearing more from the president this afternoon, uh, and uh, I'm sure that that will continue to reaffirm the, the United States' strong stand, uh, both in terms of being there for our friends and in standing against terrorism in, in all of its forms. 
And in terms of transportation and safety, um, there were a number of Americans, there often are a number of Americans uh, in that area. Many left uh, over the weekend were able to get out. Are you working to ensure safe passage of Americans who you know, feel the need to leave? We're, we're engaged on that, uh, as you know, and as you noted, so many Americans, uh, so many people who either live in Israel or have been visiting. Uh, and by the way, also a, a striking number of people trying to get in, reservists uh, from, uh, uh, from Israel or who serve in Israel around the world. So uh, certainly something that we're closely tracking. Is the administration talking about increasing uh, aid and assistance to Israel? I'll make sure not to get ahead of the president on that. Uh, but Fair uh, enough. Um, <laughs> again, he'll be speaking to that. And I know there's a lot of uh, energy and attention on uh, Capitol Hill uh, as well on that. So let's move on to some of the questions I actually prepared for today. Uh, I want to talk a little about leadership and public service. Um, we, we were talking beforehand about your roots in local government. It was only, what, about four years ago, you were the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, which to put that in Maryland terms is well, it's about 100,000 population. So bigger than the city of Annapolis, bigger than the city of Frederick, but about one sixth the size of Baltimore. What were some of the lessons you learned in local government that maybe are applicable, you know, running the U.S. Department of Transportation? I mean, I, I think about my experience as mayor every day. It is by far the, the one that, that most shapes my approach to this job. Uh, partly because I remember what it was like to be a mayor of a city that is not the largest city, knocking on the door of the U.S. Department of Transportation, trying to get things done. And so it influences me and my team in trying to work with communities of all sizes to try to deliver projects. Uh, and we're so excited about the projects that we're able to fund in, in, in Maryland alone, everything from uh, improving Concourse A and B at BWI to uh, investing in the east-west bus rapid transit connector um, uh, for Baltimore, uh, the projects in the ports and, and all around. But, but all, what all of those projects have in common is we're not actually running them. We're supporting them. And it's, it's the local project sponsor, the city, the state DOT, the airport authority, the port, that actually has to deliver. And what I learned the most from as mayor was that experience of actually having to figure out a way to deliver. I learned a lot about the power of setting ambitious targets, like the 1,000 houses in 1,000 days. And by the way, we learned a lot, studied a lot uh, of, of what Baltimore was doing as we put together our vision, um, especially because when you put a, a clear, defined, transparent goal out there, you put yourself on the hook for whether you're going to meet it and then you need to rally the community in order to get it done. And the other thing I learned was the importance of a sense of what, for lack of a better word, I'd, I'd call patriotism, but, but patriotism about a city. Um, and, and I just had a chance to meet with some, some leaders here who, who, who live and breathe that. And it matters so much from people who lead major institutions to just the kind of people who would think about getting a tattoo with the city flag um, and the kind of people who, who uh, take a risk starting a small business or, or, or uh, put their time into volunteering, that, that that wound up being the engine of so many of the good things we were able to do in a city that was written off as dying. Literally, there was a Newsweek spread on 10 so-called American dying cities that came out the week I got into the race for mayor, including it included our city. Um, but but the, a city that was never going to take that sitting down and experienced its, its best decade of growth uh, in, in a half century. Uh, you, you could see how that spirit could be animated, not, not, not created or generated by city government, but when you had the right tools in the right places, you could get those big things done. And I try every day to take the tools of the federal government and do the same thing. Well, certainly here in Baltimore, we are familiar with people writing us off and knocking us down and the folks here, you know, fight, fighting against that narrative, um, you know, to restore vibrancy to the city. Is it weird at all to be in the position of now all of these cities and all of these states are sending all their grant applications and, and, and begging you for money for their projects? And I'm going to ask you later about some of the ones here. Uh -oh. uh, being the one who decides <laughs> after having been in that position as a mayor. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it powerfully motivates you to try to do right by these applicants. And strangely, you know, you, you, with all of this wonderful funding that's available, uh, we're still saying no most of the time just because there are so many more deserving projects than there's funding. Uh, we had one program in particular called the uh, MEGA, which is mega for, for mega projects, basically. We had a billion dollars to work with last year and $29 billion of applications. 
So there were $28 billion worth of projects that were, many of which were, most of which were really good, but they just didn't make the cut that year. And so in, in deciding how best to apply those resources, it's a matter of figuring out where we can match work that's happening on the ground, where there are already good local, state, or private sector commitments that we can try to multiply the dollars with, um, that, that we uh, invest in projects not for their own sake, but projects we think will matter for the things that we came here to do. Number one, safety. Uh, and then jobs and economic development, equity, and getting more people a shot at prosperity. Climate, which is very much a transportation issue, and transportation is very much a climate issue. Um, and the right kind of innovation. Those are things that, that the best kinds of projects can help us do. Uh, but I pinch myself all the time that, that, that my colleagues and I get, get to work on these things because there has not been this level of funding for transportation in America in 50 years. Hmm. I can't hear the first part, sorry. What's the first part? Stop. Spot and golf link. Okay, so I couldn't make it out. Thanks. The Gulf South is already overburdened with fossil fuel projects. These are areas that live in cancer clusters. You're going to add another one of these. Your DOT just approved the Seaport Oil Terminal, a project that will have 80 coal plants worth of greenhouse gas emissions and will worsen air quality in areas that already live in cancer clusters. This is about environmental racism, and it's about the climate impacts this project will have. Thank, thank will you, you, um, you, Mr. Will you commit to stop? Thank you, projects? thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thanks. Would you care to address these? Yeah, concerns? for sure. So, uh, so this has to do with uh, a set of uh, proposed fossil-related projects that come into contact with our department because they require a permit from the Maritime Administration, uh, and as I hope we've demonstrated, as I believe we've demonstrated, through among other things the largest package of climate legislation in the history of any country ever. We believe passionately in fighting uh, climate change. Also, we follow- Excuse me, be, you asked the question. It's really, hard to, it's really hard to answer the question if you interrupt the answer. Um, so. <laughs> so at the same time, we follow federal law when it comes to permitting. And when a project is seeking a permit, um, we don't just decide whether we like it or not. Um, and deciding whether to issue a permit is different from deciding whether to uh, provide a federal grant, for example, for something. So, so what these folks exercising their First Amendment rights are concerned about is the, the impact that those projects could have on the climate and when they talk about cancer clusters, the other thing that they're concerned about, and it, I feel weird kind of speaking for you, but I, it is kind of my you know, turn to speak. Um, part, part of the really legitimate issue that, that is at stake here is, is the effect that uh, this has not just on, on climate generally, but on public health in the immediate vicinity of, of these facilities. And that's something we really care about. And to the extent that that plays a role legally in the permitting process, we will take that seriously. Um, but, but what I can't do is, is commit to uh, uh, you know, a certain policy choice because you interrupted the event and asked me to. But I respect where you're coming from, and we will follow the law. And can you, and can you for those of us who, excuse me, for those of us who aren't familiar with this project, can you please describe, for those of us who aren't familiar with this project, can you please describe what the proposal is, where it is, and where it is in the process? So I, I don't want to say anything off the cuff that's okay, not going to be in keeping with the very latest in terms of the progress of, the, of this permit. Um, but what I know is there's a lot of passion. There have been a lot of public comments. And what we will do is follow the law in terms of how the uh, NEPA, which is the relevant uh, environmental law, and anything else related to our permitting authorities works. I can't promise that that outcome will satisfy the folks here or anybody. But I can promise we're going to follow the law. And I can promise that every choice we make is in the context of climate action that, again, I would argue, is the biggest, most aggressive climate action undertaken by any government of any state in the history of the world.
I'm sorry, but re re respectfully, I'd like to answer questions from that. Thank you for being involved in the campaign. I would really, great, but that doesn't mean you get to run the event. I, even though you volunteered on my campaign, it, it's, it doesn't mean you get to take over the event. I want to thank the secretary for addressing this uh, unscripted question. I appreciate your response, and I appreciate everyone for bringing your concerns. But we'd like to continue uh, with the program and touch on other topics related to transportation. We can take a five-minute break. Do you want me to? Yeah, get off okay. the stage, right. and we'll escort them out, and then just come right in. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break and uh, resume.
unexpected interruption, we will bring uh, Secretary Pink back out in a few minutes. Ten, ten minute break.
Hello, hello. Okay. You all can hear me. Hello. You've been asked to leave. I'm notifying you that you're trespassing on private facilities. Okay. And you've been asked to leave. Okay. You're welcome to move across the street on public property anywhere around the facility. You're welcome to represent your cause and demonstrate and continue. Uh, but as far as in this facility, uh, you're not allowed to continue. And so. Officers. Officers and resources are on the way. Thank you. Listen, folks, you made your point. You made your point. Go across the street peacefully, please. So you don't want to have to be forcibly removed. Would you kindly leave the facility?
you for your patience. We wanted to make news today. This is not quite what we were expecting, um, but I am happy to report um, that Secretary uh, Buttigieg would like to come back out and finish the conversation. So we will bring him back out in just a minute as soon as you all take your seats and we will get going again. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming back. <laughs> I wasn't so sure for a moment there. Uh, yes, thank you again. Welcome back to Impact Maryland. Again, I'm Pamela Wood from The Banner, joined by Secretary Pete Buttigieg uh, of the Department of Transportation. Uh, we apologize for that disruption. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do you want to talk about what we just happened here? Yeah. Um, okay, so. I won't make the protesters' point for them. I obviously respect their, their First Amendment rights. And I actually, re I respect where they're coming from because they're passionate about fighting climate change. I'm passionate about fighting climate change. Part of what's at issue, and I won't get too much into the particular issue because I think there's actually litigation going on and uh, there may be developments that, that are more recent than the last time um, I examined this issue. But, but more broadly, we have a situation where it's clear that we need to decarbonize the entire transportation sector of the United States and of the world. Um, in some areas, it's easier than others. Like, uh, uh, we already know using existing EV technology that if we can just make those EVs more affordable and get the charging networks more widespread, we, we can radically transform the carbon profile of driving. Flying is a completely different matter. At best, in the near term, we can increase the use of what are called sustainable aviation fuels that have a lower carbon footprint. Uh, but in terms of airplanes that don't have to burn fuel in order to go, we're a ways away from that. And, and so there are all these different things that are happening over these next decades that if we act aggressively enough, we can keep alive the goal of the, the Earth not warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. But in the middle of that, we're still using fossil fuels. That doesn't just end overnight. And it presents some real dilemmas. For example, uh, the building of a pipeline. At, at a, in some, I'm talking about a hypothetical pipeline at a location where fossil fuels will be transported in that direction anyway. And if you don't build the pipeline, they will be transported by truck, uh, which could have more safety uh, downsides and have more carbon emissions. But if you do build the pipeline, you're making a new capital investment in fossil fuels at the exact moment when the country is trying to decarbonize, right? These are the kinds of things that, that we're wrestling with and that I would argue our administration is doing a really good job at dealing with uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act, through uh, the, the infrastructure transformations we're making. But it's not overnight, it's not flipping a switch, and it's not simple. And so my hope is that we can continue dealing with that in, in a good faith fashion. Um, but my hope also is that some of those folks who were just here saw what happened when I was in front of the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee two weeks ago trying to persuade a Republican member of Congress that the seasons changing is not the same thing as climate change. And it, this literally came up. And so we've got literal climate deniers, and we're talking like people with college educations in positions of enormous responsibility who can't be bothered to even admit that climate change is real. And then you've got folks on, on the maybe outer ends of the activist community seeking to be, uh, you, you know, seeking a pathway that, that is more realistic than, than most um, believe is possible. Uh, it's faster than most believe is realistically possible. Uh, and we just, gotta, we, we just gotta push. I get the urgency. I mean, look, by the time my kids are old enough to ask, which isn't that long from now, 15 years from now, we gotta have a really good answer on what we did in the 2020s 
to get ahead of climate change. That's real. Uh, and again, I would argue we've done an amazing amount of work in the uh, almost three years we've been in office here, and we're not done yet. And now in terms of that, in terms of that path towards, um, you know, fighting climate change, um, you mentioned electric vehicles, yeah. um, which uh, are gaining in popularity, but still I believe less than 10% of new cars sold. There are some significant hurdles. Uh, the prices are still very high. It's not in my budget yet to have to buy an electric car. Um, charging infrastructure is kind of scattered. Um, how how do we as a nation overcome those barriers? And and how what's a realistic time frame for having say, you know, half of new cars sold being you know full electrics? We think we can get there by the end of the decade. Um, and the the answer I don't mean to sound flip, but to simplify a bit. The, the basic answer is to make them cheaper to buy and put more chargers in. And that's literally what we're doing. So the incentives in the, the Inflation Reduction Act take thousands of dollars off the sticker price and incentivize domestic production in a way that the fundamental price, with or without incentives, falls each passing year until it is unquestionably cheaper than a gas car. We're already getting close. On some models and some types of vehicles, if you factor in the cost of fuel, the cost of maintenance, because they don't break down as much and they don't have as many moving parts, uh, we're, we're getting closer and closer. Uh, but it's still out of reach for, for so many Americans. Although we should talk about used cars. That's how Chas and I got our first EV. It was about 14,000 bucks as a C-Max uh, plug-in. Uh, right, 14,000 is in my budget. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll follow up afterwards. Um, then the other thing is the chargers. Now, part of what we need to do is expand our imagination because this is a very different thing uh, than the last hundred years of, of, of the automotive sector. Charging a car will have more in common with charging your phone than it will with filling up your gas car. And what I mean by that is, it will be possible for a majority of Americans to uh, fill up their car electricity-wise, either at home or at work, in a way that was never possible with gas. On the other hand, it opens up a whole new set of equity concerns because that's easy enough if you live in a single family home with a garage. But what if you're in a multifamily dwelling in let's say West Baltimore, uh, where it doesn't yet pencil out for a private company to put in a charger? And that's why we're investing $7.5 billion in charging infrastructure to make sure that areas that are underserved and areas just along long stretches of highway have, have the chargers. Anyway, we think we can hit that goal of half of new sales uh, getting to EVs in about a decade. And we know that we're gonna have to work hard to make that a reality. Another issue I wanted to touch on is uh, the Infrastructure Act. It's a you know, signature accomplishment of the Biden administration. I, I have a feeling that most regular folks actually don't know very much about it or how it's helping them. I think if you ask a man on the street, they wouldn't necessarily know. Um, what, are, what do you tell people about it and what is it bringing to Maryland? So. My, my favorite subject. Um, it's bringing an enormous amount of investment to Maryland. It is the biggest investment in the transportation infrastructure of this country in my lifetime and then some. And yet, I know I'm at a tender age as cabinet secretaries go, but still, um, much longer than I've been alive since we've done anything like this. It's the most we've put into passenger rail since Amtrak was created. It's the most we've put into public transit ever. By the way, as excited as I am about EVs, one of the best things we can do for climate is to invest in reliable, frequent transit. It, it has a massive benefit. And we're a pro-transit administration. Uh, most we've done for airports in a generation, ports and, and, and Baltimore is benefiting from this, uh, including, by the way, port electrification, because when you uh, electrify, well, first it's the ground operations, the, the think of the trucks getting the containers back and forth. But eventually, we can also have alternative propulsion for the ships. The emissions from those ships is one of the reasons why communities, disproportionately black and brown communities that live near ports, have higher, systematically higher rates of things like asthma. Uh, we're investing in that. Again, not under technically a public health title or, or a climate title, it's under the ports title, but that's, that's some of the benefit that's gonna come from that. And what we're really investing in is the future competitiveness of this country because we will not be able to lead the world in the 21st century using 20th century infrastructure, but you get what you pay for. And since, really since the Reagan administration, we have not invested enough as a country in our infrastructure. We're paying for that, and we see the consequences of all, all around us. And we're finally getting it right. Doesn't mean that it'll be overnight, 
but we are now beginning to see some of the first projects completed or at least launched into construction that were funded through this infrastructure legislation. The other thing that I think is really important to mention is that now we're used to the infrastructure law. So many big things have happened in the last two or three years, it's hard to keep track of them, bad things and good things. And one of the really good things that happened was this infrastructure law, but it's only been a couple of years. And it was far from certain that that law was gonna get passed. Uh, matter of fact, the polit political obituary of the infrastructure law was written multiple times in 2021. We had to push like crazy to get it done. Um, and I had great conversations just in the, in the ride over here with, with Senator Van Hollen and Senator Cardin, both of whom were uh, a big part of getting that done. So were a lot of members of your House delegation here in, in Maryland. Um, but we did get it done. We got the bill passed. We got the funding lined up. Now we're in delivery mode, working with partners like uh, uh, port authorities, cities, airports, uh, partners like Governor Moore, uh, to actually deliver on, on the possibility there. Now, you got on a applause line there when you mentioned uh, investing in mass transit, and I think this audience is probably full of people who know about the importance of the Red Line project, which is a proposed east-west transit route across Baltimore. Uh, it was uh, discontinued, it was taken off by the prior governor, Governor Larry Hogan, and Governor Moore has put it back forward. Now, I know that you can't pick your favorites, uh, and you don't decide yourself which gets funded, which doesn't, but what should Maryland and Baltimore be doing to make sure that they are as competitive as possible to get the federal money that's necessary to pay for it, because like, we can't pay for it ourselves? Yeah. So yeah, let me, let me begin by again stating that we are a pro-transit administration. Of course, when there has to be a new road, build a new road, and we'll help you with it, but you can't pave your way out of every transportation problem. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of places where they've tried to do that, and the result was you had the same amount of congestion with twice the amount of vehicles. You have to create alternatives. Yes, you need, you need good ways for, for vehicles to get to where they're going, but you have to have good transit options. And by the way, good transit options don't just benefit the people who use it. It benefits you even if you don't use it because there's less competition and congestion on the road that you're on because the people who do use it. So it makes all the sense in the world, and that's before you, you factor in the climate and health benefits. So... Uh, like you said, I, I can't get too much into the details of it. I mean, if you wanted to announce the money for it, I think there would be some happy people here. <laughs> I will say this. I think the, the alignment, the commitment of a state and a community really matters. And I see that coming together here. It matters because very few things ever get funded by one level of government alone when they're at this scale. And so we need to have a good state and federal partnership to get, to get big things done uh, in, in, in a vision like this. Um, it's also really important that there be healthy and strong community engagement. The, the processes that we go through, again, we, we generally don't decide whether it was a good idea policy-wise to build this or build that, unless it's coming to us for, for a discretionary grant. But what we do is we make sure that the right engagement has happened. And by, the law, by law, we have to. That's, that's part of what the NEPA, the National Environmental uh, uh, Protection Act, is all about. Um, it's really important that, that neighborhoods understand that this is being done and, and authentically experience that this is being done with them and not to them. And the more you have experienced exclusion, dispossession, um, destruction, which has happened, including with federal highway dollars in a place like Baltimore, the more of a trust deficit there is going to be. So even for something that, that project sponsors believe will link and support underserved and overburdened communities. There may be a lot of work to do within those communities to make sure that the communities agree that this is to their benefit. And again, I see all of the ingredients in the building blocks here uh, and look forward to seeing how that develops into, uh, into more and more specific visions. Oops. We'll see where that goes. So uh, we're running short on time. I appreciate you coming back out again after that. Let's end on, on a couple fun questions so we can all go out of here with a smile. Um, you travel the country as a cabinet secretary. Do you have any idea how many miles you cover in a year or a month? Yeah, I actually, I had them count this up because um, I had some members of Congress asking me about my travel. And um, <laughs> some of you saw that. Uh, I've been on... I think they found I'd been on over 600 airline flights. So if, if you've ever been canceled or delayed, I promise you, I feel your pain. It's one of the reasons why we've been working so hard to make sure airlines take 
better care of passengers. And they are, and we're not done. Um, but uh, they counted it up, and I think we're coming up on 200,000 miles. Because uh, you can't do it, I mean, it's literally transportation, right? You can't do a job like mine from behind a desk in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and the, one of the best parts of the job is going to communities and seeing the impact that these transportation projects have. Whether it's, I was in a place in Alaska that cannot be reached by road or a lot of the time by water. I talked to the mayor, she was buying an, a car. The only way to get her car there was by barge, she thought, and it was gonna cost an extra $8,000 to get it there because the barge only comes every so often and she was gonna have to wait six months. And this was a, not a wealthy community, it was an Alaskan native village. She finally figured out a way to get it shipped at a tr considerable discount, closer to $6,000, by letting the air out of the tires and taking the top off so that it would fit in a plane. Wow. And they flew it. So whether the transportation needs are shaped by that kind of reality or whether um, we're talking about the east-west connector in Baltimore and what bus rapid transit and potentially a, a, an expanded red line could mean in a community where there, there, there are folks who are trying to get to economic opportunity who live in Baltimore and they're trying to get to a different part of Baltimore and it's gonna take them longer to get to that job when they don't have a car using transit as it took us to get here from Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. when we did have a car. Um, seeing that and talking to people and, and bringing real benefits is, is, is the best part of this job. So um, anyway, yes, travel a lot. We haven't been to every single state yet, but we're getting close. How many left? Six. Six. And we're going we're gonna to do it. All right, well, thank you again for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.